So coronavirus is a massive story. Should we be panicking? Let's look at the data. Today we're going to talk through four charts showing how coronavirus compares to different diseases on all sorts of measures and yeah, how dangerous is it for you? So let's have a look first at the number of cases that we've seen starting from day one of the epidemic or mm -hmm. when China first reported it to the World Health Organization. And let's compare it to the last famous epidemic, SARS. The number of SARS cases stayed kind of low and then stabilized at around 10,000. So after about 176 days, it's just under 10,000. And, and again, like you said, everyone was panicked about SARS. And rightly so, because it had very high fatality rate. It did. And then let's look at how coronavirus, COVID-19, compares to that. So again, we start from the first recognised case. Yeah, so I can see from this, there is cause for concern. Yeah, you know, that's well over 60,000 after, you know, 60, 70 days compared to under 10,000 after 176. Yeah. I counter to this that still the number of deaths is very low, especially compared to SARS. We're looking at a mortality rate of around 2%. It's more in a range, but it's still at around 1,500, around that. So it's very, very low. OK, so you're saying, yes, this the cases line may look scary, but the yeah. deaths line is not so, so anything to be too worried about. Yeah. I mean, by comparison, for example, it's estimated that around 60,000 people die from seasonal flu in the US alone every year. So, so far it looks like it's remained fairly contained. Here we have the Hubei province. It's uh, the epicenter, it's where the epidemic first started. It spread around China, but as we get further and further from Hubei, then we see fewer cases. And I guess that's because the Chinese government immediately enforced a lot of quarantines and that kind of thing, and, and there was a lot of travel restriction. Now, there have been, obviously, some cases in other countries, but as we can see here on one of our own graphics... The vast majority have remained in China. And again, you see the, the localization factor. China is more connected to its immediate partners, so there are a few more cases in places like Japan and the rest of Asia than there are in the rest of the world. However, you know, people, as you've looked at, have died outside of China. We've just had uh, three deaths outside of, outside of China. If we compare that, for example, to the Spanish flu, when we were seeing just a fraction of the global mobility that we have today, then during that period in 1918, we saw more deaths than in World War I and World War II combined. So I think that those numbers really put it into context. Of course, that was before vaccines. But um, I, guess, I guess the other thing there was... That, you know, you had millions of people moving around the world because of the war, and that was sort of yes. widespread, whereas today they've been able to really lock down the, yes. the international Yes. In world. this case, it's interesting, it spread more during uh, business conferences, and so possibly as a result, we saw that middle-aged men seem to be more uh, vulnerable to this particular virus, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But let's look at the deaths outside of China. Okay, so... Three weeks after the epidemic started, we had just four cases reported outside of China. Now we're in mid-Feb, we're looking at just under a thousand and they have been all over and around so 20 here, countries uh, in the space of, how, how long has it been? In just a couple of months. And yeah. again, we're looking at just at the cases outside of China now. Yeah, yeah, forgetting China for a second. Within this space now, we're in mid-February, we have only seen so far three deaths. We're going to pin them in yellow. One's in non Hong Kong. One was in Japan, an 80-year-old woman. And one was in the Philippines. The fatality rate is still very low. And really, the numbers say that it's not as concerning and as fatal as other epidemics, including the seasonal flu that we see every year. It's how infectious it is that I think is really what we should still be focusing on here. Should we have a look at that? Let's compare seasonal flu to coronavirus. In terms of the infection rate. Exactly. Yeah. And let's start with two hypothetical families of five. This is my family with seasonal flu. And here's my family with the current COVID-19 strain of coronavirus. 
So how many people do they infect? Now we're seeing what happens in those first few days as, the, as these people go out, they mingle, they mix, and that, that infection gets spread. And as you can see, it's spreading markedly faster for the people who've got coronavirus than it is for people with seasonal flu. As we go through to a second cycle, you see this even more. So seasonal flu is essentially about the same number of people, again, have been infected, whereas in coronavirus, instead of having just another 12 infected, it's now another 34. So it spreads far more rapidly, even though those two numbers, 2.6 and 1.3 that we started with, were not too distant. Mm. And this is what it's known as the R value, how many people are infected by another person. If it's below one, then it's not contagious at all. What I can see here is that the speed of contagion for coronavirus does in fact look pretty terrifying. But how does it compare with the fatality rate? That is the question. And how does it compare with many other viruses as well? Exactly. So let's take a look at that. OK, so what we were looking at there was the difference along this horizontal axis in infection rate. The sort of R value, how contagious something is. Exactly. That's that's the number we have on the horizontal axis here is of how infectious different diseases are. And we can see measles is pretty infectious. Yep. So is polio. polio. relatively infectious. The current strain of coronavirus is down here at about 2.6. Mm. Common cold, seasonal flu, less infectious. But the other really important thing, as you've mentioned, to take into account here is the mortality rate. Once you've got this virus, what are your chances of surviving? What are your chances of dying? Mm. And, and that's what we have. Two very vertically. famous epidemics, bird flu and Ebola. Mm -hmm. Basically, if we were in a pandemic, we'd be in the region of here. What we're saying is, as you move further in this direction, a disease is more infectious. And as you move further up... It's more deadly. More deadly. And with coronavirus, there is still some uncertainty. We are in the early days, mm -hmm. so let's say it's more or less in this shade, but, but it's the, a range. It's a range, and one of the reasons for that uncertainty is, you know, because of how China has been reporting the cases. Yes, in uh, initially to try and sort of contain maybe the, even the panic for the disease, they were under-reporting. And then there was a lot of suspicion about the figures that they were reporting because China does traditionally sort of fudge some of the figures. Uh, it's done so when it comes to economic growth, when it comes to poverty. And, and we talked about the, the range here. The, the key axis here for that range actually was the vertical one, the mortality rate. And that's because if you think about it, a mortality rate is the number of people who have a disease, a, a virus, who go on to die. And if either of those numbers, the number of deaths or the number of cases is skewed, is wrong, it's going to skew the results. So what was happening in China was because the Chinese were under-reporting the number of people with the infection at all, it actually made the mortality rates look a lot higher. So, so it looked a lot more dangerous, in fact, which is kind of counterproductive. Exactly. But as soon as it spread outside of China, we saw that as we saw earlier, there were only three deaths. The mortality rate was looking more like around 2%. Exactly. So for a while, the, the epidemiologists looking into this, they, ha they had numbers showing that in parts of Wuhan and Hubei province, um, the mortality rate was as high as 10 or even 18%. Mm. Whereas, as you say, once we were able to look at cases outside of China where the data was more reliable, it was about 2%. And that's because as soon as people moved out of China, like a British resident uh, coming back to the, to the UK, having been to a conference where there were reported cases of coronavirus, they get, people like that would get examined as soon mm -hmm. as possible. And we saw a case, for example, of a super spreader that ended up in front page of loads of newspapers in this country who had no symptoms. And that's why he infected 11 people. He didn't know that he should have been in quarantine. This is also one of the reasons that people are a bit more worried about the spread of coronavirus than uh, SARS, because in the case of SARS, if you weren't symptomatic, you couldn't actually infect anyone else. The mortality rate for this is pretty low, but it's the fact that it can spread easily and without people even need knowing they're ill that is why maybe people are panicking. And I think I'll be following this story closely, not because I'm in now in the panic zone, I'm firmly still in the no panic zone, but I think it's leading to a lot of interesting shifts in the relationship between Chinese society and government that might, you know, turn into a different story altogether, where we're seeing a sort of break in trust 
between the Chinese government and Chinese society. So for me, I'll be following this closely, but maybe for slightly different reasons so far. It's very FT of you. <laughs>